Welcome to Direction Northeast. Hello, I'm Chris Mitchell. This program is a presentation of the Communications Department of Northeast State Community College. This episode of Direction Northeast is all about acoustic music. We'll meet our guests and start our discussion following these messages. Northeast State's a wonderful place to start your career in college, and um, the campus is beautiful, the teachers are one-on-one. -on -one. It was an excellent decision to come to Northeast State. I've learned so much coming here. I love the school, and everyone is friendly here. This has been the best time of my life. I have really enjoyed being here. I think if it hadn't have been for Northeast, then I wouldn't feel as happy and as driven if I chose another school. Step by step, Northeast State is here to get you there. Enroll now at northeaststate.edu. What does the music of Paul McCartney's band Wings, the Pink Panther, and the TV show Happy Days have in common? The answer is two-time Grammy Award winning acoustic guitarist Lawrence Juber. He is our guest today. Mr. Juber, welcome to Direction Northeast. Oh, happy to be here. Well, you know, we're honored that you're here with us today. Um, well, let's, let me get started okay. here. Um, first, um, if you could just tell me, how did you come to be a part of Wings? I was a studio musician in London in the mid-70s. And Denny Lane, who was a member of Wings, was a, a guest on a TV show that I was playing guitar on. It was an artist named David Essex. And Denny sang a song on the show, and I played a guitar solo, and he liked my playing. And over the course of the next few months, I actu actually ran into Wings at another studio in London. And um, they were looking for a guitar player, and Denny recommended me. It wasn't a gig that I pursued. Um, but I kind of fit the suit, right. as it were. <laughs> you know, I was I was versatile. I was sober. It was all the you know I had the right attributes. <laughs> was that a nerve-wracking thing to step in? You know, with you know pa Paul McCartney and Linda and coming in after Jimmy well, McCullough and all them. Yes, uh, it was nerve-wracking to the extent that you know I wasn't sure what to expect, and it was a career shift for me because my ambition was to be a studio musician. And I wasn't intending to be in you know, one of the biggest rock bands in the world. <laughs> um, so there was a certain, you know, a certain trepidation there. But uh, it was very much a kind of a family kind of environment. And we were very much encouraged to think like a band rather than just being Paul McCartney's backup musicians. Um, and you know, I had to really think about it for about a nanosecond when I was offered the gig because I was giving up something that I'd really strived for, for a, you know, since I was a, a young teenager. Um, but I couldn't say no. Right. Yeah. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, you were in Wings from 79 to 81. 78 through 81. 78 through. Yeah. And you played on Back to the Egg. Played on Back to the Egg, Coming Up, Good Night Tonight, what uh, that th era. What do you think was like, what was your highest point in Wings? What do you feel? <sighs> Uh, there, were, there were a few high points. I mean, uh, on stage, I think that one of the high points was um, we had done, we did a track called Rockestra on Back to the Egg, which was a rock orchestra. And it was members of The Who, Led Zeppelin, Pink Floyd, Wings, and you know, various other luminaries in, in London, London luminaries. Um, and we recreated that at a concert in December of 1979 that was part of a series of concerts for Campuchia. Cambodian refugee um, benefit. Uh, it was organized by UNICEF and a promoter in London. And we, as the culmination of that series of concerts, we recreated the rock orchestra, the rock orchestra on stage with, with uh, many of these luminaries, including, for example, Pete Townsend, who was the only one that wouldn't put on the silver lame uh, jacket. <laughs> you know, we were kind of dressed for the occasion. Um, and we did let it be as part of the Wings set. When we were playing on tour, we would do Let It Be. And I played, always played the guitar solo. And there's this big orchestra going on. And it comes to the solo. And I realized that nobody else was going to step forward. So I stepped forward and did my thing. And you know, then I, halfway through, it's like, wow. And there's Paul McCartney. There's Pete Townsend breathing down my neck. And <laughs> John Bonham playing drums. And oh, just all these amazing musicians. And that was a real high point for me, because I was on stage playing with musicians that I idolized as a teenager. Um, uh, things like you know, hearing coming up on the radio and, and hearing it announced as being the number one record in the summer of 1980 was also, you know, 
how cool is that? You know, because that was, I think, the first number one I played on. I played on subsequently other ones after Wings, like for example, uh, Time of My Life from Dirty Dancing. I played on that, um, but that was part of my ambition was you know to play on hit records, you know, play with the Beatles, and I got three out of four. You know, play on hit records. I got to, uh, for example, even before I joined Wings, I played on the, the soundtrack of The Spy Who Loved Me, you know, right. the, the James Bond theme. The right. Yeah, I got to do that, which was so, so cool. Yeah, how cool is that to play the James Bond theme? Yeah, exactly. Theme? I mean, you know, for a kid, you know, kid guitar player, and, but the real deal, you know. So going back, you know, you said you got your start as a studio musician, mm -hmm. but even further, you know, how did you get your start as a musician in general? Well, I started playing in November of 1963. I turned 11 in November of 63. And 1963 was, was this kind of, this real watershed year in, in English pop music. Because January, February, you know, you got Beatles release, Please Please Me, and then this whole series of things happened. And it wasn't just the Beatles, it was the Rolling Stones, the Dave Clark Five, you know, just there was all this stuff going on. This was pre British invasion, as it was as it was termed in America, and we weren't invaded. It was all homegrown, you know. Um, and it was this progression of just wow, what an amazing thing is going on. I want to play guitar. And my my dad said, oh, you should play the saxophone. You know, he was a big band fan of big band swing. So I compromised and said, okay, I'll learn clarinet because they didn't offer saxophone in high school. I said I'll learn clarinet, but I made sure to get my name at the bottom of the list. So they ran out before they ever got to me. Week before my 11th birthday, the Beatles appear on the Royal Command performance. They're playing for the Queen on national TV. Um, and that's the show where the line where John Lennon says, you know, the, you and, you know, the, the, you, the people in the cheap seats clap your hand, the rest of you rattle your jewelry. You know, it was like famous TV appearance. And I think that the, that gave the guitar a certain kind of credibility in my parents' eyes. So a week later, I, my 11th birthday, there's a guitar. And I never put it down. And 49 years later, I still haven't put it down. And it's right here. You know, it doesn't go away. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, coming out of England at that time, were other, you know, luminaries like Clapton, Page, Jeff A little Beck. bit later. A little bit later in the timeline, 1965, 66, 67. Uh, and I was a big fan of that. Now, you know, the psychologists have, have defined 14, your 15th year. So when you're 14, it's, I, I always figured it was 14 and a half, was actually what you listen to when, when you are 14 and a half is what gets imprinted on your brain. And, and that was May, of, May, June of 1967. Are you experienced Israeli gears, Sergeant Pepper, to name just a few, that it was, it was kind of, again, it was another watershed year. You know, the 1963 was, was a crucial year. 67 was a crucial year. And it was just this constant flow of new music. But I was also motivated. I, I loved jazz. I was learning classical guitar in high school. Um, I was listening to anything I could listen to. But specifically, I would, you know, I would listen, really listen to those Clapton licks. And, and Jeff Beck, late, a little later with Jeff Beck and Jimmy Page. Clapton was the first one that I really tuned into. And then, of course, then comes Jimi Hendrix, and it was all over. You know. So do you have you know, a favorite guitar god, if you will? No. No, I, I, I think I'm, I'm kind of polytheistic when it comes to guitar gods. Um, I, you know, there are great guitar players out there that you've never heard of. And, and I get to play with people that are just, you know, just amazing and, and, and share the stage with people that are amazing. And it's, I think if I have to choose, I mean, there was, as from a jazz guitar point of view, Barney Kessel was somebody that I was really a big fan of. And, and Joe Pass, too, both of those. I would go see them when they were in concert in London. And, um, very much, because at a jazz club, you can sit in the front row. You know, I get there at 9 o'clock and I, you know, and have a pack of, pack of cigarettes and a little carafe of wine, and I'd leave at 3 in the morning, and I'd you know, go home and practice. <laughs> but being that close, as opposed to going to a, you know, a, a venue where you can't really get close enough to really you know, get. And, and with loud rock, it was a different thing from the jazz world. But 
And I, because I wanted to be a studio musician, jazz guitar players traditionally kind of, that was what they did. Because you, know, you don't really make money out of jazz. So how did you get into being a studio musician? I was in the National Youth Jazz Orchestra, which was kind of a, a training ground for studio players. And, and we did a, uh, I had been doing various demo sessions for people and just getting my name around a certain kind of scene in London. And I was in the, the Youth Jazz Orchestra. We did a BBC concert, a live. Well, it wasn't live. It was taped. But, they, um, but it was you know, a performance concert. And they, uh, the, I got a phone call the next day from a contractor who booked musicians for studio work. And he said, I saw you on television. I want to I you know, mentor you. A man named David Katz, who was kind of famous. I mean, he was the person that got Elton John started when he was Reggie Dwight, for example. He was really famous in and amongst the studio scene, um, violin player, as many of those contractors were, because their main focus is putting together you know, orchestras for studio stuff. And he really kind of adopted me as, as his guy. For, you know, and that really kind of is what launched me. And then I got to meet other people. And just I got, My name got around. Do you have a favorite session that you ever played on? A few. Um, one of the first albums I played on was, um, was George Martin was producing Cleo Lane, who was a great English jazz singer. And um, that was really cool. I was very green. And I was like too much of a stud to want to use a capo to play in a, you know, an odd key. So it was, you know, I, I kind of was, I was learning on the job. Um, I, I definitely remember one that I had no idea that I was playing on, which was um, I played on the Alan Parsons Project, Tales of Mystery and Imagination album. And I remember a session at Abbey Road that was a, an orchestra and an acoustic guitar and some mandolins and a harpsichord. And I had no idea what it was for until 25 years later I read in a magazine that Alan Parsons was talking about that session and how I played on it. And it was really. Yeah, I did. So I remember the session, but not what it was for. Um, and of course, the James Bond, you know, playing, playing that stuff, too. Well, you know, you did all these sessions, and mm -hmm. you were in Wings for a while. Um, is there any artist that you've never worked with that you'd like to work with? I wouldn't mind working with Elton. I think he's a great songwriter. I, I've worked with a lot of artists um, of all different stripes. I mean, just, you know, recently I played on a, a although he wasn't in the studio, it, it was kind of by coastal um, played on a track for Seal. Um, I have, I played with Dan Hicks and the Hot Licks, you know, uh, which so was a hot lick for a day. I mean, how cool is that? Um, and I've done my share of TV stuff, you know, like Home Improvement and stuff like that. And I played with, you know, various Muppets. <laughs> but I think that I'm at the point now where, you know, when I do, if I go into a studio session and it's for somebody like Danny Elfman, for example, I mean, that's, you know, there's, there's a, there's a, it's just kind of this high level of musicianship and compositional finesse. And, you know, then, then it's a big movie like Good Will Hunting or something like that. But with Dirty Dancing, we had no idea that that movie was going to be as big as it was. And in fact, the album sold 14 million copies. Well, how different is recording a session for, you know, a soundtrack like that than a jazz or a rock session? Well, for a movie, typically, there's a lot of musicians, it's very expensive, and they expect you to just be right there on the ball. You know, you're sight reading parts, there's a conductor to follow, typically. I mean, sometimes not. Sometimes they'll, you know, with Goodwill Hunting, there was a, just a small group of us, and, and there was a, a, a process of figuring it out, and I had made some suggestions as to how to, where to put it on the guitar. And there was a guy sitting in the corner just, plucking on various instruments that were around. Turned out it was Gus Van Zandt. I had no idea. Uh, not until we were introduced. Um, a record session could be much, much more relaxed insofar as there's a, a more of a process. You're in a smaller studio. Perhaps the song needs some work on it. When I played on Barry Manilow's last record, which was really quite, um, quite an interesting experience because he is enormously experienced. I mean, he's been making music since the early 70s and a very talented songwriter. Um, and watching the process where we would, we would work something out and then we'd all figure out our parts and we'd do a take and then he'd stand up and say, it's not working, and then he'd leave the studio. And he'd come back five minutes later and say, okay, we'll take this section out. 
you know, and, and how that creativity, and that you sometimes, I mean, as studio musicians, there's this kind of group mind thing that happens where you're listening and you're reacting. Even if you can't see each other, you know. And you know the formulas, you know the shape of it. So it's a different realm of doing it. And, and I work with musicians that have been doing it for you know, some, some of them 40, 50 years. Great, great players. Are there any uh, sessions that you turn down that in hindsight you're like, ooh, wish I wouldn't have said no? Well, one I couldn't do, I rarely will turn down something. One I couldn't do was when Pat Boone did a, did a, a, a big band version of heavy metal songs. It was the one that preceded the Paul Anker one where he did Smells Like Team Spirit and stuff like that. Well, Paul Ang uh, uh, Pat Boone did one of those, and I couldn't do the session. I was on tour, and I kind of regretted that, because that just would have been so much fun. Well, um, you know, there are English rock luminaries who, you know, like someone like Johnny Marr, who have started working with younger bands like The Cribs or Modest Mouse or mm -hmm. whoever. Are there any young and up-and-coming bands that you like, that you'd like to work with, or do you like to see them, you know? The short answer is, is not really. Um, I mean, there's some great bands out there, you know, just, um, uh, for example, I mean, just this week, uh, Vintage Trouble. Have you ever heard Vintage Trouble? They are so cool. You know, it's great bands, but I mean, there's no room for, for the kind of thing that I do. And I, I get called in to play on sessions. I mean, my daughter, Ilse, is a singer-songwriter, and she has a circle of people that she works with that Randy Jackson produces. And I play on some of her stuff. And, those kinds of sessions where I can make a contribution, and, and sometimes young artists, but, but within the rock scene, no, not really, because, you know, it's like the, they're too good. You know, you don't need a session player. You don't need that. I mean, if I, I'll come in and play some, something acoustic, you know, because, I, in fact, I mean, my, my friend Richie Sambora, um, you know, I've been giving him some, I hesitate to say lessons because that sounds like I'm teaching him, but I learn just as much from him as he does from me. But I've been showing him some stuff with alter tunings and finger picking and stuff. You know, so. Well, let's talk a little bit about what you are doing now. I mean, are you still doing session work or? Occasionally. Uh, there, there's still the one TV show that I work on right now is The Secret Life of the American Teenager. Um, I did some session work for, uh, for Diablo 3, the video game, which they have now announced the release date, uh, which I wasn't even allowed, you know, it was like uh, non-disclosure agreement, can't say when, when it's going to happen. Uh, but mostly for that, I was, compo I was a composer on that. And that's typically what tends to happen is I'll get hired not to be a session player, but to actually write the music, write, perform. I did a documentary uh, last year for NBC Dateline called Children of the Harvest that's about migrant farm workers. And they, they were going to use a library of music. And the, one of the anchors uh, for the show, correspondents for the show, said, hey, you know, I'm a fan of this guy. We should see if we can get him to do it. And, you know, they You're obviously you know, uh, noted as an acoustic you know, fingerstyle guitar player. Mm -hmm. um, what all does that involve? Playing guitar with the fingers. I mean, basically, you know, I, the, I mean, fingerstyle guitar means something different depending on where you are. You know, the Chet style, or, or Mel Travis, you know. That, that's kind of thumb picking, but it's still known as finger style. What I do in terms of, I'm playing with the fingers, um, and I'm using all the techniques of, you know, regular kind of guitar playing, but it's soloistic. And it might be something, you know, something simple like this. You know, so it's not all pattern based. You know, it might be something might be something that has patterns in it, but then I might turn around. You know, where it's broken up but it's self sufficient. I'm playing the bass and the melody. So two, maybe three parts going on at once, like a piano player would do. But rather than thinking pianistically, I call it guitar orchestration, guitar orchestration. Because what I'm looking for also is, hang on, wrong tuning. I'm looking for the resonance that happens because of these open strings and the way that the guitar can, everything can ring together. And then different kinds of, different kinds of techniques, you know, tapping, percussive stuff. 
I mean, I saw Jimi Hendrix do that in 1968. It's not, it's not new or original, but it's useful. You know? And it, 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 there's something textural about what I do. My repertoire is original stuff. It's Beatles, it's Wings, it's Jimi Hendrix, it's Great American Songbook, it's familiar tunes, because you've got to entertain an audience. Um, but it's also a vehicle for me to express myself compositionally, too. And I've written well over 100 tunes for solo guitar. Right, and I believe your most recent album is um, you doing Beatles covers. No, actually, the part. one that just came out is called Soul of Light. Okay. And it's, I, I did a mood album. I, I took a whole bunch of my original tunes, added a new one, and some interludes, and it's an hour's worth of music that is very much, I mean, my, my, I have a tune called Solo Flight, and somebody misheard the title as Soul of Light, and we just thought that was so cool that we named the album that. But. <laughs> And it's stuff like that. And, it, and it's a retrospective album of, of original tunes. So for you, what goes into the composition of you know, that whole album? Did you have like a theme in mind ahead of time? No, or? no it, was, it was just tunes that, that fit a particular kind of flow, a, a certain kind of journey. Um, not necessarily all mellow, but, but with a, um, a certain kind of romance to it not romance in the sense of love songs, but in the sense of just, in a sense, kind of romantic in the 19th century sense of telling a story, uh, you know, spinning out a certain kind of feeling. Um, so there's a narrative aspect in what I do as a composer. Because I'm, I'm writing instrumental music, sometimes what I do will, will tell a story. It might be an image that I've been you know, captivated by whether it's something I've done on a journey or you know, a drive down you know, PCH, Pacific Coast Highway, you know, uh, that kind of thing. Um, but, but melodically driven, because I try to write melodies that you know, capture people. And I also, you know, guitar players seem to like to play my stuff too. Some of it's a little hard for them. Some of it's a little hard for me. <laughs> but I like to challenge myself too. What challenges uh, do you face you know, today as opposed to when you were starting out or as a session player? Um, well, traveling's a lot harder than it used to be. <laughs> um, I think the challenge is uh, that the more I know, the, the more I have to edit myself to resist the temptation to just put too much in. I really, I, I try and, you know, and it's funny because the stuff, often the compositions that I spend the most time on are the ones that once they're recorded, I never play them again. And the stuff that I can just comes out intuitively is the stuff that kind of really sticks. So I have to be careful not to overwork as a composer. And as an arranger, I have to be careful not, I, I can suffer from option anxiety, where I'll just try to, uh, something too many different ways and, and have a hard time settling on where it's going to be. So my criteria is, how does this make me feel? How does it make the audience feel? Does, does the audience get the image? You know, so I'm, I'm very much, I think, the challenge as I get older is, is that as, the more I understand about performance, as opposed to strictly just playing guitar, but, but how to be a better performer, how to be a better communicator, and also how to be a better in, improviser, and not to interfere with the intuitions. You know, because, you know, even to the extent of when I'm improvising, just looking at your fingers and thinking about what you're doing is, is a hindrance, it's not necessarily a help. So those kind of values have become really interesting to me. Especially, I think, I learned a lot having been involved in theater, writing musicals, dealing with stage musicals, and, and occasionally getting, you know, putting on tights and playing a lute and being a medieval minstrel or something. I mean, it's just, it's a way of stepping outside of just being a guitar guy, you know. Do you prefer performing live over, you know, recorded work? They're kind of parallel interests. Um, I really like performing live. I'm not a huge fan of the mechanics of traveling. You know, if I could just beam myself from one venue to the next, it would be great, but that technology is not there yet. You know, short of doing you know, Skype concerts, <laughs> um, which people do. I mean, I, I know people that have actually kind of set up, you know, you, you, or YouTube you know, type stuff. But, but that, the virtual world doesn't communicate what 
doing something in person does. And I, I often get this, you know, people say, I've seen you on YouTube and I've heard your recordings, but I had no idea that that's how your concerts were. Because there's something that happens when you get people in a room. And the same thing with recording. When you get musicians in a room, magic can happen. When everybody's just emailing their parts in, it's, it's a composite, but it doesn't have the same, it doesn't have the same spirit. Well, what advice do you have for you know a, a young guitarist today? You know, what can you what can you tell them? I mean, other than get a day job, <laughs> um, I I would say you know obviously practice, practice and more practice. Understand music, so develop musicianship. Get the uh, the young when you're young, get the very best instrument that you can get, because that then becomes your companion. That's, you know, becomes part of you and it matures along with you. You know, guitars take it some time to really reach maturity and you want to be able to, you know, 20, 30 years down the line have an instrument that you've completely imprinted yourself on. You know, so, but, but it's got to be a good one. And that's tricky because guitars, you know, good guitars are expensive. Um, uh, but, but get the best instrument you can. Um, be exposed to a lot of different kinds of music. Or, or just if there's one thing that is just so compelling to you, then really master that. And play for people all the time. Play for everybody. So overall, who would you say is your biggest influence? My biggest influence at this point in my life? Probably my wife, Hope. <laughs> because she's the one that has really kind of just kept me away from just getting so absorbed in being a guitarist that I can't be a better guitarist. You know, if it was just the guitar, I wouldn't be able to have developed the kind of expressiveness that I've developed. I've also, I think, I mean, also her dad, Sherwood Schwartz, who you know, created Gilligan's Island and the Brady Bunch, I think was, was a definite mentor. Um, and, you know, Paul McCartney was a big influence that a very important part in my life. So I would definitely credit him. I, I can't say that he was the biggest influence because I don't know that there's any one. Um, it's really kind of, it's just, it's multiple influences. But, but people of that nature have been, you know, really very, very influential on me. Well, thank you for being here today, hey, Mr. Juber. Pleasure. And uh, we'll be back in just a moment to wrap up Direction Northeast. What if there was a place where your mind is nourished, your time respected, a place where you don't feel lost in the crowd, where you get the attention you need and deserve? What if that place is right here, right here, right here, all along, over 80 programs of study, a main campus, and convenient teaching sites, unlimited potential, right in your backyard, Northeast State, Northeast State, Northeast State Community College. That concludes the program for today. We talked with Grammy award-winning acoustic guitarist and former member of Wings, Lawrence Juber. Community is very important to the students at Northeast State Community College, and this program takes a look at a few of the subjects they find important. Until we meet next time, on behalf of the students, staff, and faculty of Northeast State Community College, I'm Chris Mitchell, and this is Direction Northeast.